Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Ad Age Remotely. I'm Janine Poggi, Assistant Managing Editor here at Ad Age. Thanks so much for joining us. Donna Special was named President of Ad Sales and Marketing at Univision in January. And today she is joining us live to discuss how she plans to put her stamp on the ad sales efforts at Univision and to provide a little bit of an outlook on this year's upfront ad haggle. Hi, Donna. Hey, Janine. Thank you, you so much for joining us. I'm so glad to be here. I missed you. It's been a while. I know it has been a while, but welcome back. And we are so glad to have you here. Thanks. Me too. Me too. And for those of you watching at home, if you have any questions or comments during this conversation, feel free to leave them on our social channels and we will try to get to them during this conversation. So uh, January is when you officially started at Univision, only two months in, but it seems like you haven't missed a beat. You know, talk about getting this role during the pandemic. First, what drew you to the opportunity at Univision and then what it was like starting, you know, remotely. You're, you're not in the office, I can see, but what has it been <laughs> like, you know, coming in, um, you know, from a virtual environment? Yeah, um, listen, I'm, I was really excited. Um, I met Wade um towards the end of the summer of last year um and he shared with me his vision um he knew that univision's foundation in the hispanic market was so was, was such a trusting brand but he had such uh, a vision of where he wanted to take this company and you know i'll be honest you know we are at a pivotal point in our society and being uh coming to a company that is so dedicated to an underserved consumer seemed really, really important. It just seemed like a really important time and really, really empowering. You know, we I looked at um, our election, our past election, and there isn't, you know, the politicians could not win without the Hispanic audience. And with that connection, think about how important it is for a brand to grow their business. So the timing was right. Uh, 2020 was an interesting year for all of us, but um, for us moving forward, I think Univ Univision uh, is definitely, the timing is right and our vision uh, is gonna take us uh, to a huge trajectory and I'm really it, happy to be a part of it. And it's been an interesting you know, couple of years for Univision, for the company itself internally. It has. Your, your appointment was part of a larger um, you know, makeup of new executive leaders that came in. You are starting to develop your team. Can you talk about like how you're positioning Univision in the marketplace and especially over the last year or so with all of the changes that have taken place internally, you know, what it means for the brand moving forward? Yeah, listen, Univision, it's not a surprise. Univision has been on the market to be sold for uh, many a years. Um, so the, um, you know, the investment has not been there um, for the company to be pushed to the future. That was obviously what Wade saw um, and what, what I saw when we talked about it is the huge potential that, that this company has. The foundation is there. I mean, it is a trusted brand completely embedded in our, in our consumers. So to me, it's basically just, we're gonna be basically building on that foundation. Um, I brought in, um, you know, I started, Wade hired uh, two other people at the same time. So he hired a head of all network, uh, Pierre Luigi's coming in and running. He's gonna be the president. He is the president and head of uh, transformation office. And we are definitely focusing on what uh, innovation for the entire company is. We're focusing on a deeper brand um, and data strategy, which um, they really, um, the company wasn't really looking into at that point. I brought in two individuals from Warner Media, one Dan Arbrisano, who I know, Janine, you know, and Dan Reese. Dan Reese is my chief growth officer. He's gonna be helping me build a lot more capabilities, um, building obviously my marketing capabilities, we're gonna be looking into our social platform. Should we dive into looking into e-commerce, a shoppable area as well. And Dan Arasano is here helping me build my audience capabilities, which you know is near and dear to my heart, which is what I built at my previous place. Um, but we're really now, Univision's in, the, it's in its infancy stage. And we needed to, we need to jumpstart that, kick it, um, building it on a linear, but it's gonna go cross-platform really fast. Um, because we need to be. 
Yeah, let's talk about the data opportunities and targeting and audience development that you see there. Um, Univision is part of OpenAP, which is the organization that you helped founded, which is looking to help streamline and make it easier to buy audiences across uh, networks and platforms um, and target audiences. So where do you see growth for Univision? Where has it played in the space historically? And where do you think it needs to go You know, over the course of the next you know, couple of months? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely different um, for our audience because we are already a segment, right? The Hispanic audience is already a segment within itself. Um, so we're definitely looking into um, expanding that. I'm very excited that, you know, Univision is a member of OpenAP because near and dear to my heart, I was one of the founders, um, you know, with Turner, Fox, and uh, Viacom. So I'm really happy to be doing that. So yeah, our goal is to, just like I did in my past, we are going to get the, um, you know, our industry into looking at us holistically to buy it on an audience basis. Um, it's probably going to be a little bit of a slower process because I need to build it, but um, we're going to have the data capabilities. Um, it is going to be cross-platform. But what I want to do is I want to I want the marketers to look at Univision holistically across all of our platforms. You know, we have a huge local footprint with 58 local stations. We have a huge radio footprint. We're in podcasting. So it's not just linear um, and digital and now our streaming service, which we're net right now in soft beta. But the goal for me is cross-platform across the entire company. So we need to get into audience targeting to be able to do that and have it be much easier for clients to look at that way. So then you're reaching an audience and you can reach the audience across the entire breadth of Univision's platform. That to me is the holy grail. Historically, have those assets been ignored or not paid as much attention to as just, you know, Univision, the network? No, um, I will say um, digital, um, you know, is where we're really focusing. Obviously, uh, the announcement of uh, Pendy TV, um, we just purchased VIX at the same time. So we now have two of the streaming services. We are the only destination for the U.S. Hispanic community um, right now at, uh, in the country. And that is massive. So we are totally building out our dig digital capabilities. Um, local is our it's huge for us. I mean, that is basically our foundation. Our news organization is completely connected to our community. Um, and so all the platforms have always been there. Um, different sales forces across the board. I oversee uh, all of national, all of digital, and the NSOs, which is the regional local. And I have a counterpart, Diane, who oversees all the local business and all the radio uh, business as well. Um, and we're basically, we're, we're joined at the hip. When I talk to clients, I talk to clients as all of Univision um, and not its individual parts. And clients can come to us and, um, you know, we will sell all the platforms as we kind of call them enterprise businesses. Or, um, or individual parts, however they see fit. Gotcha. So one hurdle historically for Univision has, I think, been in translation in that people, you know, buying Univision inventory weren't actually the viewers of the content or know people like their grandmothers who were watching yeah. the content, even though plenty of people certainly are watching the content. I know you're only two months in, but historically, what do you think have been the biggest challenges and how are you working to, you know, circumvent these? Yeah, I'll be honest. I've been digging, right? The good, the good news is because I'm here and I, you know, I'm learning, right? I was not part of this, uh, this community and the Hispanic audience. I've been digging a lot. Uh, here's the first stat that I will, that will floor you. Okay, there are 1,900, okay, English language advertisers in the network television space. There are a little over 400 that do Spanish language. Okay, that was mind boggling to me. So there's 1500 advertisers that are not touching this consumer. Okay, crazy. Um, and so that to me is a huge opportunity that needs to happen. And what, what we end up doing is we end up educating uh, a lot more than in English language because the buyers don't, um, you know, don't watch our shows, right? Because it is in 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 language. Um, so we have to do a lot of translation. So we have a show called Desperta America, 
Okay, it is our early, early morning show. It's our GMA, our Today Show. It has been around and we're gonna be celebrating our 25th anniversary. But if you don't watch it, you don't know that Disparate America is such a great show and it's so connected to our audience. So we have to translate. We have a lot of tentpole events, just like we do in English language. We have reality-based. We have a whole Sunday lineup that's all reality-based, just like you do in English language. So there's a lot of translation that has to happen and a huge education with a lot of our marketers and agencies on our community itself. Um, and that just takes a little longer, uh, but that's where we're, we're gonna be focusing a lot more of our time. Have you seen different types of conversation from the agencies and the brands yes. given the efforts to want to be more inclusive and diverse, some of the promises that have been made over the past year, has that changed the types of conversations that Univision is having? And are you seeing more of these types of conversations happening? I do. You know, to me, what I'm finding and I'm hearing is that people are realizing, clients are realizing that this is now a business imperative, not a nice to have, um, you know, you know, it's not, you know, general market needs to incorporate all multiculturals, okay? It's Hispanic, it's black, it's LGBTQ. And so I am seeing, um, again, you gotta walk the walk, but the conversations are definitely going in the right direction that um, planners and agencies are now looking at America as one holistic America, okay? Which I would say that they weren't before. They were putting general market in one place and multicultural in another bucket. And when you saw spending decrease, I will tell you that the multicultural bucket is the one that used to get down the most. So there's definitely a lot of conversations going in the right direction. Okay, now what we will see during an upfront um, and during scatter, um, we will see, but they're all saying the right thing. And marketers are definitely realizing that in order for them to grow their business, they're not going to be able to short-term and long-term grow their business without our audience. The U.S. Hispanic audience is 60 million people, okay? And that census hasn't even come out yet, the new census. So it's 60 million people that they're not reaching because most of them, okay, majority of them are in Spanish language. Now, here's what people will say to us. Well, we can reach Hispanic audience yeah. in English language, right? That's what we hear. Yes, but no, okay? Because the engagement and the connection that you make to our audience in language is something that you can't compare. And, and bilinguals now, I will tell you, we're, we now oversee all the generation. And this is why the streaming service to me was so important. Prende now is gonna broaden our reach. So Univision and Unimas definitely have more dominant Spanish speaking. Okay, but we also have bilinguals too, especially with soccer, with the fan base. Soccer and news is all generations of the Hispanic market. Okay, streaming is going to lend itself a much more to a younger U.S. Hispanic and bilingual, and that is going to broaden our reach. And so now it, there's no excuse because we're going to reach every U.S. Hispanic in our country. I'm here with Donna Special, who's the head of ad sales for Univision. Thank you to everyone who is tuning in. We have James, Joanne, George, Alan, Alexandria, Mustafa, and Jessica. Thank you for joining us. And if you have any questions or comments, leave them in our social channels and we will try to get to them during our conversation. So you're talking about streaming right now and the uh, soft launch of the streaming platform. Let's talk more broadly about the streaming wars and what you see as sort of the place for Univision in that, uh, what demand from advertisers has been in streaming. And if you think that we'll really see a shift out of linear this year and more dollars being pushed into streaming. I too. Listen, we saw it, you know, I uh, I definitely was on the sidelines last year, right? Not being in the market, but you definitely saw with the consumer behavior that was happening during COVID, streaming is taking off. Um, what I am thrilled about and what I think is really, really important for us is that Pende is an AVOD service, okay? We are not, we did not launch with an SVOD service, okay? It is free and that's really, really important to our audience. And I was really happy about that. Um, I, you know, 
our clients and our messaging and our business because we are seeing the consumer behavior shift um, and linear business obviously is shifting to streaming. Um, I think it's both. I think it's a combination. I don't think it's one or the other. I think you need to be in all places because we see it with our own with our own behaviors. You know, we do still watch traditional television for certain programming, but we obviously do um, a lot of streaming um, as well. So I think it's a combination of both and we are building it. You know, what I did notice, and what's interesting is, streaming obviously happened because, um, and all the larger media companies got into the streaming business because they saw the change of behavior, right? When Netflix came on board, um, then obviously Amazon. So uh, NBC with Peacock, and Warner Media with, with HBO Max, and Disney Plus, and everybody's doing it. But in the English language, to me, it was reactionary, okay? Because the cord cutting was happening so quickly and the decline in the linear space you could see happening. So the major companies didn't have a choice. They had to get into the streaming service to try to get that, that audience back. In our case, okay, we are not affected as much in cord cutting. The US Hispanics are not feeling it as much in the linear space. So we have an advantage to get into the streaming service ahead of the game um, and basically hedging our bet, which is great. It's gonna happen, okay? We're not saying that cord cutting is not gonna happen with you as Hispanics, but it did not and is not happening as fast. So we're basically getting ahead of the game and we're basically gonna be um, carrying both, which I think is really, really important. How are you thinking about the ad model in the streaming space? What kinds of opportunities, um, you know, ad products and things like that are you thinking about for the streaming service? Yeah, I mean, we're actually right now in uh, soft beta. So um, we're going out and uh, we're gonna be testing some models throughout the year. Um, I, uh, you, know, you know, near and dear to my heart, the consumer experience is everything to me. So we do not wanna start out uh, in, an, in a negative place. Um, right now we're looking at, I think five ad breaks um, at uh, 90 seconds each. Um, we're gonna be testing different types of um, ad models. You know, should we be doing pause ads? Um, you know, split screens, all that is going to be happening um, between now and the end of the year and trying to figure out what we do. But I will tell you that the consumer experience will be at the center of everything we do um, and that will stay true to form. I'd love to get some of your outlook on the upfront marketplace. If you think that demand will be there in the same way it's been, you know, if it'll come back uh, from last year and the weird COVID year that mm -hmm. we had, and kind of just what you're hearing in the scatter marketplace at this point. Yeah, listen, it's, um, you know, I know a lot of changes and a lot of flexibility needed to happen last year. Um, and I, I heard it was really um, a great partnership between all the companies, which, you know, I applaud everybody, which was which was great to see. But the demand is crazy. It is out of control. I mean, the scatter right now is on fire. And I think a lot of it has to do with there's just not as many impressions. The um, English language impressions in linear are definitely going in the wrong direction. And, um, you know, another example, I'm on the uh, NCM board in theaters, right? I mean, look at the past year, unfortunately, you know, there hasn't been any advertising on the big screens in the theaters. Um, and that's another avenue. Now it's going to come back and it's going to come back when it does, it'll come back strong. But that was a year of, uh, of another area that people couldn't put their money down. So it's going to be strong and I think it's going to be because I just think there's just not enough impressions, which why the demand right now, I will tell you, in Prende is really strong. Streaming is going to be a big proponent, streaming and all the digital capabilities. Um, and I'm also hearing um, a lot of conversations that I'm really happy about that the audience targeting uh, is definitely something that um, is going to be uh, keeping pushed through. You know, we're going to dabble a little bit. We're going to start looking into our addressable space. I know that there's a lot of conversations happening with addressable as well. We will be, um, you know, testing, we'll probably be more of a testing mode with addressable more than we will be going out full force. But I would say by the end of 22, um, we'll have a bigger addressable product. 
Yeah, I think last year, the key word was flexibility. What do you think, you know, will be sort of the negotiating points this year? Do you think flexibility will still be top of mind or what else might come into play, you know, as things hopefully normalize as we get into spring and summer? Yeah, I mean, I think flexibility is still key, but some of the flexibility that people are talking about and I and I think is right is flexibility across platforms because, um, you know, a lot of clients are definitely um, not happy with all the ADUs, you know, that the estimates um, are definitely um, not where they need to be or not you know, what they thought they were purchasing. So having flexibility to be able to run your inventory across platform, whether it's linear to digital, digital is streaming, that to me is where I think more of the flexibility is gonna lie versus um, having to take dollars out. Listen, they have options. They definitely wanna move their dollars when they can. But to me, the flexibility is gonna be more cross platform, um, you know, to, to be able to get their inventory when they thought they were buying it. Yeah. We have a question from Jack on Facebook. Where is OpenAP today and what is left for you and Dan to make that reach its potential? Yeah, um, OpenAP, David Levy um, is doing a great job. Not my old boss, David Levy, David <laughs> Levy uh, at OpenAP. Um, he's doing a phenomenal job. They're doing a lot of, um, they're digging into a lot of cross-platform. They're really um, looking at what to do with it, trying to get the industry into a cross-platform area. I know that they've been looking at a lot of um, demand supply areas. And, um, you know, we want to help them, you know, um, you know, the key for our audience is the right measurement because, you know, we need to make sure that our audience is well represented in the sample sizes. You know, that's the key. You don't really have that issue in English language, but you do with, with Hispanic and in Spanish because we have to make sure that we're represented. Um, and that's why there was a lot of conversations with the census and what the census um, some of the um, questionnaires on the census, because if we start, if our measurement starts going down, um, then we actually have issues. So that's one of the things that we're dealing with um, with David at OpenAP is that just making sure that we are fully represented in the measurements of what they're looking at. You and I have spent a long time talking about the various advancements in TV advertising, um, yeah. you know, but still at the end of the day, it feels like when we get into the upfronts, a lot that is done, it seems like business as usual with maybe some incremental advancements, you know, a couple of years. But what do you think will, you know, be the catalyst to see business being done differently? Is this the year that, you know, we move away from CPM negotiations and really think about the uh, audience targeting, like you mentioned, you know, for the industry as a whole, where do you see, you know, the advancements coming at what needs to happen next? Yeah, listen, I'm really, I've been watching NBCU, right? I mean, Linda's been doing a great job with her, um, you know, one platform and I'm really, you know, charged about it because, you know, CPMs aren't going away. They need to go away, right? We need to be focused on more of an audience targeting. We're going in the right direction. You know, we all probably think it's a slower process than it needs to be, but I think good news is it seems like it's going in the right direction. I want, I believe that when you start looking at audiences, okay, it starts equaling out the playing field, right? Right now, from a multicultural standpoint, again, you have Hispanic, you have Black. Um, if you look at audience across the board and it's a auto intender, okay, or someone whose lease is up and they know they're now going to need a new lease, it doesn't matter where, you know, what your origin is. It just looks like you want to buy that car. And if you're Hispanic, you'll want to reach it. And if you're white, you want to reach it. It doesn't matter. And so I really truly believe that audience needs to be the platform that we all start doing business with in a much scalable way. And that's, I'm going to still be pushing it. I pushed it before and I'm going to push it again. I just need to build those capabilities a little bit stronger, but we will be ready for the upfront. So what have you learned about joining an organization in, in the middle of a pandemic leading virtually? And, yeah. uh, you know, what, how do you think the business is going to to change moving forward? Do you, especially coming back, you know, it, 
from the year in between, like what have you seen done differently in this virtual environment? Yeah, um, listen, I had to, um, onboarding, um, you had to be tech savvy. I still am not, it's really hard. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, onboarding virtually has been challenging. I went, I've been in the office twice. Um, I, I will tell you, I am pleasantly surprised of how many meetings that I can get done. I mean, you don't stop working. You know, you start at nine in the morning and you kind of go to, you know, you have no time frame. So it kind of goes sometimes to seven, eight o'clock, which I'm sure we all don't love. But I, I feel like it's much more productive. I am pleased because I think now everybody realizes from all levels that it's going to be much better for wildlife balance. Like for women who didn't know if they could do both and have kids and not be able to work. I think that's now all gone away. And I think that's positive. You know, some of the things that scare me is a little bit of how to help train our lower levels and our mid levels, right? We have to figure out how to do that because relationships to me are still key. And we all grew up having our relationships, you know, going out and having lunch, you know, having a cup of coffee, going to have a cocktail. That's going to come back. But being in the office and having that chit chat and have that brainstorm or have that hallway conversation, you know, that's missed. And yeah. I think that needs to come back. I don't think it's going to be five days a week. You know, I think a lot of people are talking about fluidity and, you know, probably more three days. I've been talking to a lot of agencies and a lot of clients, and it doesn't seem like we're going to go back to what it was. But I think it's a positive. I really do, because I think work-life balance now is both. And I think women and men can have it all. And I don't think it's questioned anymore. And I think we're going to see more women in the workforce now um, having a more um, career trajectory in the right direction and not feeling that they have to take a step back. And I think that's a silver lining. I think that's amazing. What have you seen as it relates to the client relationships, you know, coming back in and doing it virtually? It's a little different because you already had those relationships, yeah. but you mentioned, you know, people who are maybe coming up, maybe more junior level. How do you develop those relationships virtually for them? Because you, you already have those. So it's a little different when you get on a Zoom with someone that you already know for many years. Yeah. I mean, one, I've been on a client tour, which has been great. I've been able to talk to more clients in the past, you know, eight weeks, nine weeks than I have. And I can't tell you a year. It's been <laughs> phenomenal. Um, you know, you have to keep water by your side because you, you know, you're, uh, you lose your voice. But positively, I think we've been able to allow um, lower levels and mid-level people to be on some of these calls. Like they haven't been having to have exposure, right? Because most of the client meetings that we've had, we've had to travel, right? So you don't travel in packs and bring everybody on. But when you're doing it this way, it doesn't seem as overwhelming with having so many people, you know, involved. You don't have to show your face. You could just be listening. But that's a positive. I mean, they've been exposed a little bit more. So that's great. Again, I just think it's it's the training. It's the learning. Um, it's being in the office. That to me is what we have to work on. Um, and also trying to put breaks in your day. I don't know about you, but you <laughs> need to put breaks in your day because you don't have lunch. You barely can go to the restroom. So you got to be able to figure out your calendar um, in a, more, a little bit more systematic way than I think we did before. Absolutely. I've started scheduling, even though I don't have to, of just like giving myself a half hour to feed the baby so that like I, I know. stop for a half hour. Otherwise, I won't eat lunch. So that's no, my, my schedule. <laughs> well, that's all the time we have. Donna, thank you oh, so much for joining us. It's so great to see you. And you, you can actually see Donna and other ad sales leaders uh, on May 24th and 25th join Ad Age's TV Pivot event. You can go to adage.com slash TV Pivot for more details. Uh, thank you so much, Donna, for joining us. So good seeing you, Janine. We'll see you soon. And as always, thank you to our Ad Age crew, Alfred Mascaroni, Anna Sakula, Max Sternlicht, and Elise Liffring for making this live stream happen. Thanks everyone for tuning in.